the in uh, First Thessalonians five. Hold on two seconds. First Thessalonians, I mean, excuse First Thessalonians chapter two. The thing is, oh, okay, continue. Oh, some sign. Okay, just to show you right here. Look, um, <clears throat> verse seventeen. But First uh, Thessalonians chapter two, verse seventeen. But we, brethren, being taken from you for a short time in presence, but not in heart. <laughs> Glory to God. We were moved physically, but, but still have the same heart, desire, you know, to be with you and, and um, in the spirit. Endeavored the more abundantly to see your face. What a great desire. Wherefore, we would have come unto you, I, I, I Paul, once and again, but Satan hindered. See, just showing you the devil can hinder small time, not overall, because eventually he'll make that trip. But, you know, the devil just tries to get in there and kind of create a little havoc or a little discombobulation, you know, a little strife. You know, he, he's always at work to steal, kill and destroy. Isn't he? He's always, and that's where, um, just a good um, part for you and I as believers, what's important to be, you know, grounded and settled, amen, and established in the faith. Come on now, so that you're not moved, right? Moved away from the hope of the gospel. Oh, man, I'm seeing some things here while I'm speaking. Moved away from the hope. Serious. And a lot of Christians during the time of the pandemic or little adversities in their lives or challenges or personal problems, personal issues, offenses, different challenges, they get moved away. And then they move away. <laughs> you know what I mean? They're like the prodigal son. They run far from the presence. Come on now. I'm telling you now, in this hour that you and I live in, you don't need to be far from the presence of God, right? Don't move away inwardly first. People move away inwardly first. And I'll tell you, you know, everything in life, you know, they move away inwardly first. People go, oh, that brother left the church. That sister left the church. No, they moved away inwardly from God. How many of you understand? They moved away from God. They didn't leave the church. Can't take it personal. They moved away from the Lord. Don't tell me they left church and they're still serving God. You're deceived. Stop it. You're, you're, you're deceived, man. You bought into a lie. And that's what I'm going to correct today with some of this. So that you and I in the next coming, I, for whatever reason, that we stop, we stop drinking the Kool-Aid of the falsity and fakeness of another Jesus. Amen. Because the real Jesus is working in the earth right now. Amen. Jesus is working. And he's going to show himself in the, you know, maybe in our lifetime, we believe so, but we see the things going on, biblical things going on. And so, you know, people are moved away. It's not, this is not a game. I don't really care how many people here, so to speak, the, the more the merrier for their sake. But look, man, this ain't a game. Don't be moved by the flesh. The church of Philadelphia was a very small church in Revelations. Read their history. But they were very powerful, very small, but powerful compared to a lot of other churches. And they're the only church that never was rebuked. Okay, so go look, you know, so it's not always in a big church. Jesus rebuked the big church, the small church, Philadelphia. Go look at what he said about them. So, you know, don't be moved by numbers. Uh, only be moved by revelation and by the power of the Holy Ghost. Amen. So um, what I'm going to. Uh, talk about this morning is uh where are we going to start at this morning i wrote a couple little notes down but i'm not going to stick to all my notes oh i was sharing at the church last week uh pastor Fayuz, and i thought this would be a good analogy i said how i preach i kind of figured it out how i i preach and that's why it takes so long because it's like a meal you know and and truly how many of you know if you go over to uh, other countries you know a real meal takes what england if you go sit down with the queen 
Do you understand the process it takes? There is a, a order. There's an order of which food comes out, the proper things and utensils and things of such, uh, you know, to eat a salad. There's a soup spoon. There's a this spoon. There's a that spoon. There's a teaspoon. I mean, and so there's a protocol in which things go on. So I was sharing last week and I said, uh, mine is kind of like messages are like, like a meal. Like, uh, so I wrote down, it's like a four course one. It's like, first you get an appetizer, which you're supposed to enjoy for a period of time, then a main course, then a coffee and a coffee or tea time. And then you get a, uh, um, a dessert. <laughs> so, uh, I thought about that, just humoring myself because, you know, we, we have long messages, but is it really long compared to the time you're doing in other things in life? Not really. I mean, the time it takes just to go to other things, to go to the doctors or to go, you know, here or there or wherever. It's just when we come to church, the devil's always trying to, or the flesh is trying to tell us, you know, we got something else to do, you know? So you have to break off those shackles and those chains that are lies. that are lies, okay? Because we spent a whole lot of other time doing a lot of other stuff. Me and my mom watched a really good movie the other Friday night. And we both looked at ourselves and we we're like, this movie's long. It was about, what was it? Uh, the, yeah, Denmark. It was about, no, it wasn't. It was the Danish. The what? No, well, it was about it was it was gave you it, it, here's what it did so we don't waste our time. It gave you most movies you see that came out about World War II give you the perspective of the war and the military. This one gives you the perspective of a neutral nation, and it was how this family some sided, you know, with the Germans. How uh, it was Denmark, wasn't it? Denmark. So um, it was Denmark, and how this they they could colluded with German, some of them, but some of them didn't, and how the business played into it. It was a really interesting movie. It was very long, um, and you can do That's how evil it is. Evil presents itself as though it's not going to destroy and demolish, you know, everything in your nation. That's what Hitler was. He was evil. So he presented himself as though, you know, he was, uh, I, I can't think of the word, let's say you're Germany, but he presented himself to, the, to Denmark, who was in a neutral place. They weren't for or against, but they allowed Hitler some access to the place, and they didn't want to be like France and all those other things. You have to do the study of the history. But what I'm saying, they allow, but as soon as they allowed, guess what? How many of you know, when you allow evil a certain foothold, it begins to spread itself, and that's what it did. All of a sudden, their economy, now think about it. Just think about this, because this is true of the devil. Just like in war, what do, you, what do people want to do right away besides just shoot bullets and kill one another? Occupy. They, they occupy, but when they occupy, what do they go after? Infrastructure and resource. Right away, don't they? They, they want to right away take the resources that... Uh, you know, scale down the, the infrastructure that's been there, right? Topple it down and take all the resources, natural resources, you know, finances, whatever they can. That's what they did to Denmark eventually. They cut out their, the way their economy worked. And they said, basically, so this guy had to compromise then and side with the Germans because now his business, which was thriving and prosperous before, now he could no longer get resource supply so he had to and his wife told him don't you do it and it was a, a it, it was a choice between moral and money it was a really interesting movie you should look at it because the reality is is that's that's how evil is it eventually corners you to make a decision of your spirituality over something that's natural and earthly and that seemingly has to do with self-preservation that's how the enemy works, right? So eventually then <clears throat> he can choke off what is right, true, just, and good, and wholesome, and pure, right? And then tell you 
well, you're preserving. But how many of you know the reality is, is the only one that can ever really preserve you, right, is God. And so let me just add this last point, then we get to the scriptures, because it's called The Darkest Hour, which is probably one of my favorite movies. Because in this movie, now, if you didn't know some of the history, then you wouldn't have picked up on this line. But the, these, these Danish, right, they're Danish. They're, they're Danish speaking with some other people that are there. And they're like, well, London's about to be overtaken by Germany. So that statement was made because it, it seemed like that. Come on. It seemed like, so they were, the Denmark was saying, well, sh London, which is a central place at the time, was, they were thinking, well, gee, that place is, we're, we better, you know, if London's already being overtaken, what will happen to us? And they, and they were talking, see, fear and the enemy was already working and engineering their demise. And they were like, they already had given in that London was going to be taken over. The UK was done, that, that, uh, the Germans would breach that and, and take over that island. But how many of you know, God had a different plan. Glory to God. Amen. Lord, Even against, you should watch the movie, against all the counsel, the opinions, uh, the pressure that Winston Churchill faced during that time was, you know, insane. Truly was a tr is true. And at that moment, in that hour, he chose, you know, he chose not to give in. He chose not to sign a treaty with Germany because he knew once you sign, that was it. They, then they'll overtake you. You compromise, you accommodate. And all of parliament had already compromised, many of them. Many of them were given in. A powerful story, man, how to stand. And he, he didn't compromise. You should watch the, the movie. And that's where actually he and, and all of the troops were trapped. All of uh, most of his, uh, how many of you know what the English are famous for? They're part of the, one of the most important aspects of their military. What do you guys know? Their, their naval. So their naval was trapped up there near Dunkirk in France. Right, Dunkirk is a place where Pastor Rick lived. So when I was up there, I got to. They were trapped, and they uh, they had all the the bombs. They were trapped, and he somehow came up with an idea, and it was called Operation Dynamo. And the whole percentage, of hundreds of thousands of troops, were preserved and saved. And England then went on, and and Germany was defeated, and their island was preserved. The Danish thought that they were going to lose. They had sold that idea, the devil, right? And look, Winston Churchill, I mean, one man, I mean, one idea, you know? Praise God, that moves me, man. Glory to God, it just shows you. I mean, all the pressure that guy was under, you know? You got to keep the fight in you, man. So many people, they just, give in and surrender in the middle of adversity. Look, let me just tell you something. Christianity was not born out of just, you know, everything's fine and dandy and hunky-dory. Get over it. You know, you've watched too much Christian television. They've sold you something. Yep, thank you, Lord, as I was reading this morning. They've promised you liberty. But the liberty you have is on the inside. It's dominion. The gates of hell will not prevail against this revelation. So there's a lot of churches mentally assenting and a lot of Christians. But when a little Peasley pandemic showed up, they couldn't even handle that. What would you do if Germany was breaching your borders? You know, what would happen then? What, what would happen if you were like Israel right now? Missiles were coming into San Francisco. Come on now. You know, let's keep it real. What kind of faith would you have then? I'm not saying us. I'm just saying. We need to prepare ourselves, have a right mindset. I mean, 3,000 missiles launched over your Tel Aviv and, you know, whatever else. Don't think everything, get, the Iron Dome takes everything out. Some things got through. And look at the other side, too. Other people were destroyed, too, in, in Palestine. So, you know, um, the point I'm trying to say is, you know, the devil's at work, you know. And our faith is most of the stuff people are talking about here in America is their bills and this and that and a lot of other stuff. 
you and I, man, and make sure we're taking it beyond that. Amen. All those things will take care of themselves. Your money will take care of itself. Seek first the kingdom. Keep your mouth moving. If, if you'll just acknowledge him as your provider, your supplier, your sustainer, you acknowledge he meets all your needs, even when you don't see it. If you would just give voice to those truths and you're serving God and you're seeking the kingdom, man, it'll all work out. I guarantee you. God don't lie. It, he don't lie. Amen. Just, just, you know, that's it. He don't lie. You got to be sold on that truth. So, uh, and really what, what operation that's actually, you've never heard anybody say that. Maybe now they watch on TV. That was what the Lord gave me when I, when I launched something in Europe, it's going to be called operation dynamo equipping the Pete. No, I'm serious. Operation Dynamo. You ain't never heard no Operation Dynamo. You ain't a, Operation Dynamite. <laughs> Operation Dynamo. All through England. I haven't lost my my desire to go. It'll be. I was talking to my friend every day over there. Launch, equip people to really move in power, not a bunch of mental ascent, head knowledge, and feebility. Amen. Power. Power don't mean you don't love people, but Jesus is not weak and feeble, and Jesus is not given. How many of you understand to the, the tone of the flesh and the move of the earth? My thoughts are not your thoughts. My ways are not your ways. Amen. Doesn't mean you don't love people. Just look in Revelation. Those I love, I chase and I correct. Amen. And so just like I was sharing the other day, it's amazing how many people have a re relation with Jesus, but Jesus never addresses any of their character flaws, their defects. But yet Jesus, when you look at Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, he always says, oh, you a little faith. Where is your faith? He always addresses heart issues, but yet in, yet in many people's teaching, you never hear anything, and yet the Bible always addresses the heart, but in a lot of people's teaching, you never hear them address heart issues, motives. He, Hebrews 4.12, the word of God is living that sharp than two-edged sword, piercing the divine and thunder's joint spirit, bones in the marrow. It is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. We just act like everybody has all the right great motives. Well, believe the best of them. Believe the best of them, but understand that humans have certain uh, ways and propensities. And if you ain't been with God, I'm not even getting to the message yet. Look, if you ain't been with the Lord, I guarantee you your heart ain't synchronized with his. You may enjoy the atmosphere of a corporate anointing and get a few goosebumps and like worship and call that Christianity. That is not Christianity. I was talking to Eric the other day, and he's like, I'm praying, bro. And I was like, no, you ain't. He's like, yeah, serious, I am. He's like, and he just told me, he's like, how he just sitting there, and he just, just he goes, I just sit there in silence, bro, and pray in tongues or whatever. I was like, oh, welcome to the party now. I was like, great. Because what you see is a lot of music and a lot, nothing wrong with music, nothing wrong with worship, nothing wrong with the smoke lights and machines and all that stuff. But the reality is Christianity was born out of a deep, intimate relationship. And when you look at, look at, let me just tell you this. If you're depressed, you haven't fellowship with God. Well, you know, some people just lies. Stop. I see people going, look at this great book, Head Knowledge. You can't be depressed and walk with God. No way. It's impossible. But if you have false doctrine, then it's, they make it acceptable. Because what it does, it removes the responsibility of you drawing so close to him that his power destroys, melts down, breaks the yoke of this earth. Amen? Because if you truly believe in the resurrection power that's on the inside of every Christian, that I'm not saying you're not tempted to be depressed. I'm not saying you're not tempted and challenged to be discouraged. I'm not saying the devil doesn't come and try to camp upon your mind and emotions and bring, bring the doom and gloom. I'm not saying that. Of course he does. He's done it in my life and tries to do it. But what I'm telling you that the supernatural life of and, and the authority and the power of redemption that that you have now acquired in Christ gives you the right to break that off your life and your mind, your emotions. It, 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 it gives you the right to determine what your attitude is going to be, what mood you want to be in, that you are separate and not governed by the weather, 
other people's feelings about you, other influences, other challenges, other problems, adverse, no, the authority and the life of Jesus in you, no, it, it removes you from the external conditions. You no longer have to allow those to have dominion, influence, or control your life anymore. What I mean, and it starts with your thought life, doesn't it? That's why Smith Wigglesworth made that quote. The most important thing, the one thing that counts is that you be filled with the spirit and, and filled to overflowing. Anything less than that is displeasing to God. You are commanded by God to be filled with the spirit, right? Um, and, and then he says, uh, the, the only safeguard from dropping back into your natural mind and thinking is to be filled again, your natural mind thinking where you can get nothing. You can get nothing out of your natural thinking in the realm of God. You can get nothing. There is nothing available in your intellect that's going to get you, uh, you know, uh, victory. There's nothing in your, it's all out of the spirit. You have the mind of Christ, right? Um, and so he says, you can get nothing. Uh, the only safeguard is to stay filled, inundated, saturated, and your cup running over. Jesus said, hot or cold. Jesus said, cup running over. He never said half a cup is okay. Quarter of a cup is okay. He wants your cup spilling, running over, full. Amen? He didn't say, uh, be half filled with wine. He said, be not filled with wine. See, he, he, he says, be not filled with wine, meaning he just right away says, don't be filled and drunk. He never says, don't have a glass of wine. He says, just don't be drunk and filled and inundated. You get it? So he went to the extreme because that's what the natural man is outside of Christ, is an, an extreme being because of the influence of sin. There's no stability. So everything man does is excessive, isn't it? The, what brings harmony and balance is the relationship you have being in Christ. And so it says, be not filled with wine, whereas next, but be filled, be inebriated, be intoxicated, be continuously filled with the Holy Ghost over and over every day, saturated, filled, intoxicated, inebriated. Amen. That's why Paul said, I'm, if I'm insane, I'm insane for Christ. Right? So you look during the pandemic, what went up? Alcohol sales. Alcohol sales went up. <laughs> ice cream something else to fix you whatever needs to fix you you know this that or the other but the reality is being intoxicated with god saturating yourself and it's a choice amen um so but you see people move away from the hope of the gospel i'll, I'll just read this then i'm gonna get to where i gotta go he says uh in um colossians i want to read this to you real quick uh, let me see. Uh, do, 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 do. Uh, Colossians one twenty three says, "If you continue in the faith, if you continue in the faith, do you, just think of this. Just because you go to church doesn't mean you continue in the faith. Faith is a choice and decision that you make every day of your life, isn't it?" to stay in faith. The Bible teaches us. 2 Corinthians 13 tells you, examine yourself, test yourself, prove yourself to make sure that you are in communion with Jesus, that you're in faith. You know what I mean by in faith, meaning you're depending upon him. You're acknowledging him. You're saying, just like uh, I was reading in this book by Brother Mark a while back, and I've been meditating on that thought like I shared Tuesday. The the world needs to receive Jesus. You need to really think about this. But the church needs to receive the Holy Ghost. You and I need to receive the Holy Spirit. A lot of Christians just wake up and they're just, but they don't acknowledge his ability. You need to say, Holy Spirit, I receive today your counsel. I receive your comfort, right? I receive your help. See, by virtue of humbling yourself right there and acknowledging your dependence upon him, what it does, it allows the Holy Ghost now to have a rite of passage to work and function in your life. It allows him to speak up. See, the Holy Ghost is a gentleman. He never go beyond your will. 
unless you choose to allow them. You have to open the door, just like the Bible says, neither give place to the devil. See, the devil can't come in unless you open the door to him. Same way, the Holy Spirit can't just do what he wants. He needs your, your, your permission in a sense. He needs your faith to acknowledge him. Amen. Acknowledge and recognize that he's there. He's a very present help right there, ready. Amen. Ready for you to yield to him so he can speak. He can remind you. He can help you and I. So he says, if you continue in faith, ground it and settled and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel, which you have heard, which was preached to every creature. See, moved away from the hope of the gospel. Well, I'll just tell you this. If you're not in church on Sunday, you've been moved away from the hope of the gospel. You think there's hope in the Giants game versus the Dodgers today. You think there's hope at the movies. You think there's hope at the Van Gogh and the arts. You think there's hope at the beach. You think there's hope somewhere else. Amen. There's enough Holy Ghost in here today. Listen to me. There's enough Holy Ghost right now in this room okay i'm just telling you now I'm amping it up more there's enough power wisdom and revelation right now in this room if you're receiving see i put a lot of time over the years on studying and 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 preparing myself and put too much dependence upon myself it's not what i can give i don't even need a lot of notes i spoke a whole message last week for someone without notes you need to receive what the holy ghost has you need to value what's putting forth amen and a lot of times, what happens, just like I shared at Pastor Fries, is familiarity. Familiarity will rob you and hinder you. You think you're smarter than God. Amen? Don't let that happen. Even last week, I was sitting there in front of Brother Fries, and I'm like, praise God. Every word he said, stop looking at the flesh. Receive what the Holy Ghost is saying. Take that truth. Bury it in your heart, like Jesus said. Have an ear to hear. Write that thing down. Go home and reread that and focus. And don't let the devil take that revelation from you through situation circumstances see look at these wonderful people they got their kids they're on a bike ride on a beautiful sunday they all got their masks on outdoor uh and everything else they have hope something for something else they have hope of something else but i'll tell you and that's life god's merciful and gracious and he allows people but when a time of adversity comes their dependence will be on the earth they won't have the power. They won't have the needed authority, dominion, and power to work their situation out. Or what most people do is they have the they have the last minute attempt to try to call on God. Sometimes there's a response, isn't there? Sometimes there's a rescue, life preserver thrown out, you know. But other times it's not. That's none of our business. We don't know why that happens. It just does, right? I'd rather have my dependence upon the Lord and his word. Amen. All right. So moved away from the hope. Don't be moved away from your expectation that God is faithful. Come on now. He wants to do exceedingly abundantly above all you and I ask or think in every area. I'm not limiting that to my wallet. Come on now. Amen. Are you excited this morning? Amen. I'm not limited to that. What is God going to do in your life in the next 40 years or 50 years? Come on now. And if you're thinking in the devil's line up in this church telling you, well, you know, that's great preaching and that's for the pastor. But me, I'm kind of old and I don't really have the education. I don't have the, the connections. I, man, lies, all lies, lies from the pit of hell. All things are possible to him that believes. That's it. If you're a believer and you're fully persuaded about what the word of God says, then you can be placed in a position, elevated, promoted, launched, thrust forth. Amen. There is no other excuse. You may need to put some time in, in the secret place so that some things that God put in you since you was in your mama's womb could get unlocked. And therein is the big lie that you don't have time. Because there's something supernatural a God placed in every person in this church. And it goes far beyond just driving that FedEx truck on Sunday morning trying to earn your little wage. There's something supernatural. But you and I got to mine it. And therein is the problem. Nobody wants to mine. 
everybody wants to just slap an investment in there and then have it turn over overnight and produce a massive harvest. That happens sometimes, you know, but that ain't the norm. The norm is you sow and you reap. And there's a process of cultivation, watering. Come on now. We live in a country, everybody wants instantaneous. What to do with that one? It don't work like that. There is a supernatural suddenly. Amen? The greatest suddenly you can have every day is, is God just coming and manifesting. That's a good suddenly. You were at home worshiping and all of a sudden, suddenly, the atmosphere changed. Come on now. Suddenly, the atmosphere changed like yesterday. I'm sitting there because I mind. I opened my Bible and sat there, prayed in tongues, had, had a little music on for a moment, and then and yielded my attention, yielded my heart, yielded my spirit, yielded my inner life to him, and then suddenly, suddenly everything just went. Shoo. And there I was in his presence, conscience of the reality of who I am in Christ. It was like a banana split. <laughs> so you can have that every day. Choose. That's why the Lord said to Mary and Martha, one thing is needful and she hath chosen. You got to choose. A lot of people say, well, yeah, I don't get it because you didn't choose. Yeah, I did. I did it one day. You did it once out of 30 days and you expect miracles. The problem's not God. The problem is your lack of sensitivity to him. So you have to break up the fallow ground in your own life so that the life and, and the, the liquidity of the Holy Ghost can flow in the, the ravines of your emotions and of your mind and free you up. So that you can experience him. You, you understand? And there's lots of issues that you and I deal with. Unforgiveness, frustrations, anger, uh, uh, strife. See, the devil's always trying to keep you weighed down in your flesh too. Conspiring with all these different things. When you have to just slowly go like this. You have to wipe them all off. Daily. Now, sometimes it's good just to do a good house cleaning. Thank you, Lord. I will do that. That's why I like this book right here. It is probably one of my favorite books. My Heart, Christ's Home. I haven't even given you a scripture yet. I will. But this book is all about a house. This book is all about a house. And I'm going to read you just a segment. Let's go with the, what do you want? Do you guys here? I'll let you guys pick. And then I'm going get to get to my message and you're going to eat it up. Do you want to go to? The study, the living room, the dining room. How, how about the work room, the rec room, the bedroom, the hall closet, or transferring the title? Which one do you guys want? I like the hall closet. What do you think about the hall closet? You want to read the hall closet? Okay. All right. I gave this to a gentleman. First off, let me just read you a small introduction. In his letter to the epistles, uh, Paul says, God grant strengthen Ephesians 3, 16 and 7, that Christ will dwell in your house, dwell in your hearts. Without question, one of the most remarkable Christian doctrines is that Jesus, through the Holy Ghost, will actually enter your heart, settle down and live there in the human heart as you welcome him. Uh, he said to the disciples in John 14, if a man loves me, he will keep my word and I'll make my abode and home with him and dwell in him, walk in him. I'm just adding stuff. Uh, it's interesting. Jesus uses the concept of the home. I go to prepare a place for you. He's promising that he'll prepare. Now, let's look at this facet of the hall. Because herein is a good way to keep things clean. So that you and I can experience that moment. Kind of like in the movies. Where somebody shoots a bullet at a superhero. And in slow motion he goes. And the bullet goes. That's what happens in the realm of the spirit. There is no time in eternity. Things stop. And you become conscious of the great I am. Come on now. 
You become conscious of his infinite love and his power and his wisdom. Come on now, that which is of the unseen realm, now you've embarked on the light of his glory and you begin to fellowship and you begin to drink out of that river of life. Come on, you begin to see clearly. Hope begins to flourish. Come on now, faith arises. Come on, you have a sense of love and validation and approval. You recognize yourself by experiencing him. That should happen every day. And then when you come out of there, you like, hey, you little mountain, you ain't nothing. But see, you try to speak to your mountain, but you ain't been with him. Even though the Bible says, whoever will say unto this mountain, be thou removed, I cast thee, not down, sorry, believe the things he says, come past, he'll have whatever he says. But it works better when you've been with him. Because faith has to be online. And there's nothing but him. See, maybe you could use your faith. Actually, the Lord said it in 1 Corinthians 13. Though I give my body to be burned, though I feed the poor, if I don't do it with love, it, there's no benefit. So it's possible you could live a Christian life and kind of do all the Christian deeds and, and experience some of the blessings and benefits, but yet really not ever encounter him. And our greatest quest should be to encounter him. And then when you encounter him, you're more patient. You understand how stupid people are. I mean, how, how wrong people are at times, how silly they are. We are at times, right? You're more merciful, right? You're, people that, you know what? People that abandon Christian relationships and things, they ain't right. You may not be in a relationship intimately like you were before. Do you understand what I'm saying? But you as a Christian, you must always, you, you realize that person's a believer, you know? But you, what I'm saying is you, you'll pray for them. Say you were divorced or say you, you know, had a falling out with another sister or brother. You don't just cast them to the waste. Even Paul, look in the scriptures where he said to, about the one person, he had to be ousted from the church, didn't he? He had to be excommunicated for a while. But what did Paul say later? Come on, help me out. Please tell me you re receive him back. And actually the Amplified says what? Restore him in your what? Affections. This is the problem with a lot of Christians. See, you can't communicate freedom if you ain't free yourself. You restore people in your affections, man. Who's in charge of your affections? I didn't say you had to hang around that person. I didn't say you had to have them over for dinner. I didn't say you had to go to the movies with, but you have to restore them in your affections and see them that, you know, maybe they are broken and fragile and they've been fractured and dashed, but you have to love them. You love them in your heart, even though they're rebellious or they're, they're hardened or whatever their case is, who knows, you know, you have to in your heart, love them and restore them in your affections, right? That's your job. So you stay clean. So let me read this. Then I'm going to get to these scriptures. Amen. Are you getting anything at least? I've just told you this is the appetizer. The hall closet. Okay. Or Sinet, why don't you come up? Come on, Sinet. Come on. Nancy, you want to read it? I'm trying to pick somebody that never reads. Come on. Or does something. All right, man. I know. Come on, man. You're the family. All right the hall closet you ready there's one or one more matter of crucial consequences i'd like to share with you one day i found him waiting for me at the front door talk about jesus because we're at the end i found him waiting for me at the front door an arresting look was in his eye an arresting look was in his eye uh as I entered, he said to me, there's a peculiar door in this house. Something must be dead around here. Uh, it's upstairs. I think it's in the hall closet, Jesus said. As soon as he said this, I knew what he was talking about. Indeed, there was a small closet up there in my house on the hall landing. 
just a few feet square. In that closet behind the lock and key, I had one or two little personal things I didn't want anybody to know about. Certainly, I did not want Christ to see these things. They were dead and rotting things left over from my old life. Not wicked, but definitely not right, nor good to have as a Christian. Yet I loved them. I wanted them so much for myself, I was really afraid to admit they were there. Reluctantly, I went upstairs with him. And as we mounted, the odor became stronger and stronger. He pointed to the door and said, there it is. There's something dead in there. Angry. That's the only way I can put it. I had given him access to every other room in my house, the study, the dining room, the living room, the work room, the rec room, the bedroom. Now he's asking me about this little two by four closet. I said to myself, this is too much. I'm not going to give him the key, the authority in that area I'm adding. Well, he responded, reading my thoughts. If you think I'm going to stay up here on this second floor with this smell, <laughs> Jesus said, you are highly mistaken, friend. I will take my bed out of the back porch or somewhere else. I'm certainly not going to stay around this smell. And I saw him start to walk out down the stairs. When you have come to know the love of Jesus, one of the worst things that can happen is to sense him withdrawing his face or fellowship. I had to give in. I'll give you the keys, I said sadly open the closet and clean it out i haven't the strength to do it he said i know you haven't the strength just give me the key just authorize me to handle the closet and i will so with trembling fingers i passed the key over to him he took it from my hand and he walked over to the door he opened it entered it took out the putrefying stuff that was rotting in there and he threw it all away. Then he cleansed the closet. He painted it. He fixed it up all in a moment's time. Supernatural. Immediately a fresh fragrant breeze swept through the house. The whole atmosphere was changed. What a release and victory to have that dead thing out of my life. No matter what sin or what pain there might be in my past, Jesus is ready to forgive, heal, and make me whole. Now that, my friend, is the work of Jesus and the Holy Ghost. And if that has not gone on in your life or is not presently happening, you don't know him. I don't care who you are, what Bible school you went to, how big your little church is, or whatever your case is, you don't know him. Period. Amen. That's the truth. Now, I want to just point out something here that's important, Then I'm going to get to my couple of verses. I want to just read this to you because what, what I see here is this. He says, um, uh, na, 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 na. just a couple of things, uh, things from your old life. There's things that we all carry into Christ. They're not in Christ, but they're from our old life. And they're not right. They may not be sin. Notice he says, reluctantly. He says, also, there were some other things. Uh, uh, oh it made me angry see here's the problem when jesus starts to excavate in your life and sometimes that's the pastor preaching at church anger occurs anger is just fear fear that i don't want to let go i don't want to turn it over i don't want to submit i want to protect what i think is blessing and benefiting my life but it really stinks and is rot it's a bad attitude it's unforgiveness it's my old mentality it's something that is not of him. And there's a lot of Christians in San Francisco in the churches. And see, the problem is, is even this kind of conversation challenges them. It doesn't challenge me. We realize that all of us in our lives carried something when we became Christians. And, and the problem why people get angry is because they, in their own little natural mind, want to, I'm going to change. No, you're not. 
You don't have the power. It's like Jesus said, but they can't see it. They won't let go. They think in their own strength, in their own ability, in their own uh, networking that they can fix themselves. That's nothing but flesh and Old Testament mentality. Works. Dead, what the Bible calls dead works. The only way you and I can experience more freedom, liberty and emancipation, is through our intimacy with him. Hearing his word and then allowing him on a daily basis. And then you and I acting, never being angry, but always understand how much he loves us, how much he wants us to grow up in him. Why? Because just like this man said, sometimes there's things you hang on to them and it's like mentalities or unforgiveness or little attitudes or little behavior patterns or little ways. And then what, what happens is once you get free from them, you realize, thank you, Father. Thank you. How stupid I was. Well, there you were, just like I. We hang on because they're they're familiar. They're security blankets. The little parts of your life that, like he said, he knew. That's why I love this book. Because every time I read this, I want to fall down on my knees and say, thank you, Jesus, for being my savior. Even though I know who I am in Christ, there's always more work. Do you understand that? More and more. And the older we get, the wiser we get in Christ. So that's why I love this little book. This little book. If it don't put you to your knees, there's something wrong with your heart. There is. I, I hate to say it. There's something. You have a callous heart that will not open up. And a lot of Christians have that. They go to church. They put on a happy Christian smile all through San Francisco, but their hearts aren't for him. And, of course, he loves them, doesn't he? And he's working, but the reality is this. He wants to go deep. How many understand? Deep sea fishing. How many like, how many like king crab? I mean, would you eat king crab? How many, you know, how many know king crab is expensive? And you don't like king crab? Oh, okay. Do you like king crabs in that? Lobster. Okay, lobsters. All right. But to get king crabs, do you know it's 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 like almost life risking? You got to watch that show on Discovery. People have to go deep. See, to get the good things, you got to go deep, don't you? I mean, there, there's 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 things that are hidden in the earth. They got to be mined. So you got to go deep sea fishing for certain kind of things, right? You want to? You got to go out there. They're in the deep. Right. And when the Lord wants to go deep. So let's look at a couple of verses, though, because I want to just share a couple of things real quickly. Second Timothy, I'm just going to read a couple of things to you and then maybe I'll, I'll just quote it to you. Second Timothy, second Timothy two, six says, wherefore, I put you in remembrance. That thou stir up the gift of God. Remembrance. How forgetful we are. We forget a lot of stuff, man. Right. You can, I'll quote you the verses. You can, actually you can look in Hebrews 2. Uh, here's the continual defeat of man that hinders him and robs him of walking in the light of redemption. It's forgetfulness. Do you know it's not even the devil? It's man forgetting. It's man staying in a continual revelation. How many of you understand? Staying on point. It has nothing to do with the devil. It has to, you and I letting things go. Look at Hebrews 2. Hebrews 2. It says it right here. Hebrews 2. Here's a good example, too. Just a simple message today. I'm going to hurry up. Hebrews 2 says, Wherefore, verse 1, Therefore, we ought to give the more earnest what? To the things you've heard, what? Slip. They slip. They go away, don't they? When you don't stay on top of them. What? What's so funny? Oh, they slip away, don't they? I mean, the Bible tells you this, that lay aside every sin and weight, which what? So what? Easily. But I know you and I, we all think we're smarter than that. Don't we? We think that ain't never going to happen to me. It's easy, the Bible says. It's easy. So what does that tell you? Be sober and vigilant. Be on guard. Be aware. Be alert. Be conscious. Go. 
Be coherent all the time, right? Isn't that what Peter said? Be sober and vigilant for your adversary walks about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. He don't always show up with a marijuana joint and go here, hit this bro. No, you and I are probably past, you know, going to a bar and hitting a joint, hopefully. But what he does, he, he, he suggests things like, you feel gloomy today. That stuff ain't working for you. Nobody likes you. Nobody loves you. It's never going to work out. You're lonely. <laughs> There's always, I mean, it could be the other stuff. There's always some garbage. Look how that person treats you. You know, there's always some aspect that he's going to suggest or he's always looking for a way, man. You're never alone. You see people on Facebook all the time. I'm so alone. And they're Christian. And then they got, then they, then they be holding up their Christian books on faith. <laughs> I'm like, which one is it, man? Or they got fake smiles like, oh, today's a cheery day. Uh-huh. I don't think you're that cheery if you're not in Christ because it ain't real joy. It's earthly joy. Either Jesus is right or you're right. Which one is it? Either Jesus is right when he said, you know, uh, my peace I leave you and it's like my joy I give you uh, and no man takes it. But the joy of the world, there is no joy in the world. That's temporal joy. Whom having not seen you believe, though you see him not, yet in believing you love him, yet in believing you rejoice with joy unspeakable eternal full of glory so if, if a person really has joy there'll be the glory of god around real godly joy produces the glory the glory if the glory's in that see that's why the joy in christ the merry heart does good like a medicine holy ghost joy produces healing worldly joy don't produce no healing you could walk up to somebody, and if you had the Holy Ghost moving, came God, rises peace and joy in the Holy Ghost, lay hands on them, ah, if it was a real Holy Ghost move, and they'd be healed. But a worldly person, you never seen them go in a hospital and laugh. You ever seen a person go in a hospital and laugh? They go to their relative's bedside, and they're praying, and they go, Never. But a Holy Ghost man full of the Holy Ghost, full of the love of God, full of joy, full of persuasion that God's the healer, he's the redeemer, that it's going to be all right, that all things work together for your good because you love God, you're in his kingdom, you're in Christ. They'll walk in and start praying and all of a sudden the, the, the joy of the Lord, the oil of gladness will bubble up. And people think, what's wrong? You need to be more serious. See, that's the problem. You're so serious because you have a bunch of unbelief weighing you down. You can't get past your little emotional threshold. It says, who for the joy set before him endured the cross. Amen. Jesus had joy. Who for the joy set before him endured the cross. Let me say it again. Who for the joy set before him endured the cross. So you and I have to cultivate that in our lives. So Jesus might want to say, let me get that stinky attitude out of there, that whining, that complaining, that kind of self-pitying, that murmuring, that grumbling. Let me extract that, son. I want to take it out and let me just have, give you a vision of every day being happy, being joyful, I should say. Let me give you a vision of not complaining. <laughs> let me give you a vision of just every day just saying, this is the day the Lord has made. I will rejoice, even though all hell's breaking out around you. That'd be a good step for us, wouldn't it? If we could just make that affirmation every day that, that, that no, rejoice in the Lord always, man. I will rejoice. Mind, shut up. Stop, Satan. I will rejoice. I will be glad. Come back and go, oh, yeah, this is a situation. No, I will be glad, Mountain. Didn't you hear me? You make that choice to be glad. You make that choice to joy in the Lord. How many of you know? You're still alive. You're still in the ring fighting. Come on, you're more than a conqueror. But if the devil can minimize your vision and get you to see yourself in the natural, then you'll be stuck. 
you'll be defeated. There's an interesting thing I heard Brother Mark say on, on one of his shows when he was a, a young man in Africa. He was talking about uh, all the flies that go in. You see all the children, they're always, and even when I was in um, um, Fiji up in the mountains, there's the, over the meal that the pastor's daughter and wife, the women all prepared, the daughters came out when every time the food was placed on the table, they had these fans and they just stand over the table like this. That's their job so that flies don't land on the food. they're waving and so he told the story right about the flies the flies they like to go where the moisture is in the children's eyes and so they go in those like they and and they carry bacterias and they try to land in there and you see how many ever seen like magazines and little flies on children's eyes and and eventually they they quit fighting some people quit i mean imagine i do this all day long I mean, pretty soon, some, some people just give in and just, and they do it once in a while, but they just, how many understand? Well, what happens is those flies put a bacteria in their eyes and you know what happens? They go blind. And you know what Satan's called? Lord of the flies, Beelzebub. So if the devil can just always minimize or, or lay a bacteria or a disease or something in your vision. You understand? If he can just move you away from your hope and expectation of what Jesus can do. Come on. I mean, praise God for people that have been in this church. I'm just thinking, how do you lay down the hope of the gospel and then pick up the work and tools of the flesh and think you're going to be successful in the world? You're weighed in the balances. I'm telling you now, be careful. You're weighed in the balances. Do you know what I mean by that? You think in your natural mind. And the devil just sets people up, man, for failure and falls because they default back. They move away from the gospel and they default back. And they, it's like, see, we're talking about being in a remembrance. It sounds like a small word. And you probably sit here and thinking today, I'm always in remembrance. But see, you missed the whole message then. It's about staying in a constant place of being conscious and cognitive of these things. It's about being aware and being in a continual remembrance. And, and you and I aren't that smart to just be always in remembrance. Just like that guy in the hall closet needed help. Jesus knew. That's why Jesus said, how be it when the spirit of truth has come, he will bring to your remembrance because he knows you don't have the power in of yourself to draw it up you ain't that smart and if you think you're that smart you're headed down a wrong road you're not smart enough in and of yourself do you understand that nor am i that's why he gave us the holy ghost he, he gave you the comforter because you won't find your comfort anywhere else in this earth don't think you're going to find your comfort in another man, another woman, a better job, a bigger bank account uh, in Hawaii, in, in Australia, in, in, you know, in, in the Eiffel Tower. I mean, don't if you think you're finding your hope somewhere else, you're highly deceived. Or your comfort. He said, I'll give you the comforter. I'll give you the helper. Come on. I'll give you the counselor. Right? I'll give you the the intercessor so when you have hard times and you, you're facing affliction in life i'm not saying but jesus said don't cry on everybody's shoulders and tell them how bad it is no james says if any man's afflicted let him pray so when you begin to pray you don't know what to pray or how to pray you just know you're going through heaviness weightiness and adversity and you begin to brombo shake you begin to pray out and all of a sudden that affliction lifts because the Holy Ghost begins to come alongside and help you in that, in that realm. Amen? And that bondage is broken up. And the plans and schemes and trickery tactics of the enemy are dissolved. Amen? He says, take heed. See, people forget Mark 6. Remember the apostles when they were on the ship? What did Jesus say to them? When they were on the ship and they saw those, and then he, it wasn't the 5,000 or the 3,000, but he said, what happened? Why are you so dull? Do you not remember the fishes and loaves? They forgot already. Read it. Mark 6. We read it last week. They forgot about the miracle he'd done. They just easily drifted right back into 
fear and how are we going to do this? And they, they didn't stay cognitive that, wow, look at G, they should have been elevated to the next place. I'm thinking of Deuteronomy 8. Okay, go to second. Go to go go to James real quick. James 1. And I'm going to read this. And then I was going to tell them we'll read. Oh man, I'm not even going to I got to get to just after this two verses and then we'll close. I'll just quote these to you. What is what is what is Psalms 103 said? Bless the Lord all my soul and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord all my soul and forget not. Forget not. Forget not. My son, attend to my word. Incline your ear. Let it not depart from thy sight. Keep it in the midst of your heart. Forget not. It's easy to forget. You know what's easier to forget too? The people that have been in your life that helped you. I notice a lot of tendencies with Christians. It's sad. It's an utter disgrace too. You've been there helping people. You've invested and deposited in their life. They forget. They'll be judged. They'll be judged. You know why? They're, they'll be judged. I didn't say they'll go to hell, but they'll be corrected and judged. People that have helped you in your life to get to places spiritually to grow and develop, and you disconnect and you don't value, there's something really wrong with your heart. There's some, I'm telling you, there's people in my life, I can't look that anybody's invested in my life spiritually that I never, no matter what they've said or done, and some of them have mentors, they've said things that were wrong or mean or in the wrong tone. I've never allowed myself by the grace of God to maneuver me away from a relationship. Do you understand that? Over an offense or a strife or a disagreement. I kept myself in a good place by the grace of God. I can't speak on their behalf, but I, I have, you know, that's the truth. You know, you got to keep your heart right. It's amazing. People don't value. People don't, even if a person changes on you, you know what I mean? Maybe you don't have the same relationship that you had. You must value what they, the time they took and invested in your life way back when and mentored you and gave opportunity and exposed you to other Christians and good teaching in life. But it's horrible. Don't ever be like that. Value the people, you know, that, that put emphasis on your life. You know, maybe a teacher, maybe a coach. How many understand what I'm saying? Very important. You know, how you, you, that's why I was telling somebody yesterday about coaches that do baseball now. They're just field coaches. There's a lot of Bible teachers, but how many people really care for you and invest time and energy in your life? That's what Jesus did. He invested time, energy, truth. Now, of course, you have to watch, you have to observe because sometimes people you invest and, for whatever reason, they, they are who they are. Okay. Where did I tell you to go? James. Let's look. We're going to hurry up. James 1. You know the verse 23, 24. And then I'm just going to move. It says, uh, be doers of the word and all that. And then in verse 24, he says, um, if a person's a, a hearer of the word, He's like a man who observes himself in the mirror, uh, who looks carefully, but then he thoughtfully observes, and then he goes and he forgets what manner of man he was. Now, here you go. He forgets. What do you mean, what manner? What manner of person are you? I'm a spirit being. I'm not to be controlled by my natural man. I'm not to allow the lust of my eyes, the lust of my flesh, the pride of life influence me. I'm not to allow that. What manner of man am I? You know what I mean? Lust of the eyes, the eyes. I'm not talking about sexual lust. It includes that. I'm just talking about the, the greedy longings of the mind. You know, I'm not to allow anything to influence me, but the reality of who I am in Christ, that I'm the righteousness of God. I'm a new creation in Christ Jesus. Old things pass away. Nothing should dominate, influence, or rule me, but Christ in me, the hope of glory. I must remember every day what manner of man I am, who I am. That way, when the oppositions come, the challenges come, the trials come, I'm able to let the Holy Ghost navigate me victorious through them. Amen? And challenges come. 
The devil's always sending something. The Bible tells you love bears up under everything and anything that comes. Let me hurry up. Let me just read this. Go to, go to Titus real quick. Titus 3. The real you. I like this in Titus. The real you. Just remember who the real you is. Who's the real you? I'm the righteousness of God. Amen. In Christ, I'm more than a conqueror. God has for me who can be against me. I'm his workmanship. See, a lot of people can say that. They go like, yeah, they say it. But when you and I say it, it should be something that's in there. Something we really believe. I really believe I'm his workmanship. I'm not sitting here this morning with seven people uh, because I believe something else. I believe I'm the workmanship of God created in Christ. That this truth is working. This is not just a, a, a message on how to be happy on planet Earth. And then someday you'll go to heaven. This is a message about a lifestyle governed by the, the law of redemption, the law of the spirit of life. It's made me free that I'm not going to allow people's opinions, people's views, people's ideas, a pandemic, a government, a, a, a Trump, a Biden, a Pelosi, or anybody else to have any influence over the life and the quality that I choose to live. Now, I'm not saying that many times situations don't present themselves, but I'm going to, thanks be to God, always triumph. I'm not going to allow my children. I'm not going to allow anybody except Jesus. Amen? Titus, what's Titus, Titus 3 say? Titus 3 in verse 5. Not by works of righteousness, which we have done once again. It's not of us. But according to his mercy, I like this, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Ghost. That stirs me up when I just think of that. That means that God got into the fabric of my existence. See, if this ain't a revelation, it's kind of like what Brother Mark said. If you're not excited about what God did in Christ, you ain't seen him lately. <laughs> that's it. You ain't seen him. Regeneration. That sounds like something in a lab. You know, during the pandemic, they went into a lab and they were trying to figure out an antidote and they had to do how many of you understand they're looking under microscopes high powered lenses and they're trying to figure out something that on a molecular biological structure their uh, level they're going to find an antidote right that's what god did in an unseen realm regeneration glory to god come on now he 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 injected you with a real vaccine that got in you supernaturally when you said i believe jesus died for my sin I believe God raised him from the dead. Jesus be Lord. And something supernatural happened in a moment of time. The Holy Ghost came in your heart, regenerated you right then and there. Imparted to you the life of God. The Zoe gave you his nature. You became right then. You went from darkness to light. You became righteous from unrighteous. You began to be a person. You went from a hater to a person that has the love of God now. Now you have to cultivate that. It has to consume you. That's the problem. We don't get transformed by the renewing of our mind. So people just get stuck in going to church on Sundays. And they either do a few of these or they do whatever they do. And hey, the big man or whatever they do. It's foolishness. You need a reality of redemption to hit you. Walk in the light as he is in the light. And you have fellowship unbroken true fellows one another and the blood of jesus cleanses you from all sin and guilt and keeps you cleansed from sin and guilt all its forms and manifestations sin is always trying to manifest in some form or way but if you're walking in the light of this reality of who you are in christ you stay cleansed the blood is perpetually washing you amen this message was brought to you by living water fellowship san francisco you can connect with us on Facebook or email us at sflivingwater.com.